Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I'm your humble host, Coach Jason Coop. And this episode of the podcast is with an up and comer in the endurance space today. And that seems like it has been a theme over the course of the last several weeks. Today on the podcast, I have none other than Luca Filippas out of Milan, Italy. Luca is a PhD researcher as well as an endurance coach for all sports. And Luca just happens to be focused in a lot of his research on this big picture question of how different training design actually affects outcomes. And I have come to appreciate this type of work likely the most out of all of the research that I read. And that is because it is just so incredibly practical for athletes. They can look at a training intervention and decide is that training intervention the best one for me or is there another one out there? This research just happens to be extremely difficult to pull off though. You have to have a lot of athletes. They usually have to go through long interventions and the one that we talk about during the course of this podcast is 16 weeks long. And at the end of the day, it's up to the coach and up to the athlete determine, to determine if what intervention is going to work best for the outcomes that they are actually seeking. I can guarantee you that those of you who are not familiar with Luca's research and Luca's work today will be over the course of the next decade because he is solving these problems that are so important for athletes and coaches alike. So with that as a backdrop, I'm gonna get right out of the way. Here's my conversation with Luca Filippas. Thanks for thanks for coming on. I appreciate it a lot. Um, I got a I got an insider tip that you're one of the up and coming coaches and physiologists in the space. So I figured I'd bring you on before you were in <laughs> such high demand that you uh, uh, that that you had that uh, you would push little plebes like me down to the down to the very bottom of of, of mm. the rug. <laughs> um, but um, but before we get into it, you know, we have obviously a. a a predominantly an ultra running type of audience. And, yeah. you know, I just mentioned you're one of the kind of the new kids on the block from a physiology and a coaching perspective and, and maybe a little bit removed from the ultra running uh, scene, which tends to be very insular, right? We tend to kind of play in our own play in our home pool. So before we get too <laughs> far into it, like, who are you and what do you do? And tell us a little bit more about your lab and your studies and what's going what do you have going on at, at the university there? Yeah, yeah, I'm um, based in Milan, as I said, and I'm, I, I've studied uh, at University of Milan, both my bachelor and master studies uh, in sports and exercise science. And now I'm working as a, a researcher at the Uni Milan. Um, I'm basically working on endurance athletes and determinants of endurance performance. Uh, both running, cycling, and triathlon. So these three disciplines are my main focus in research. And I think I, I can say the same for, for my um, coaching experience. I may, mainly work with uh, runners, triathletes, and, and cyclists. So uh, basically I, I have these two, two activities. So part-time with the university and part-time endurance coach. Um, I have my, my own team uh, with uh, runners, triathletes, and cyclists. And I mainly um, have athletes from, from Italy, but some other athletes from other countries of Europe. And I train um, around 50, 55 athletes. Uh, individually, uh, it's pretty <laughs> demanding. <laughs> That's a big athlete load. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but n not only elite athletes, just few elite athletes and a lot of amateur uh, and uh, recreational uh, athletes. Okay. So, Luca, you're one of those rare people in the space that does research in endurance sports and also directly works with the athletes. And yeah. one of the reasons why I reach out to people like, like you the most is because you're able to bridge 
not only what you do specifically in the research world, but also what other people are doing in the research world. You're able to create that bridge in from that academia into athletes. And not everybody is capable of doing that. As you as I both know, there are some very, very, very good researchers out there that don't want anything to do with directly working with athletes. They want to stay in their experimental design and their labs and things like that. And that's fine. And they're fantastic at it. Um, so I, I always appreciate people like you, like your uh, people, people like you and the experience that you can bring to the table. The paper that we're going to discuss is a perfect example of that. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a pat on the back before we even get into this. So un unbeknownst to the coaching staff that I work with, I kind of asked them uh, off the cuff, what what research designs would they like to see come out in the space to kind of help them answer questions with athletes? And right out of the gate, when I, one of my really smart uh, colleagues, Corinne Malcolm, she, she said, I want to see stuff on training design. Like yeah. this training design versus <laughs> that training design preser pr produces these types of results, which is exactly which is exactly what we're going to talk about because ultimately those end up being the most functional ones because you're comparing two very maybe not very different philosophies, but you're c comparing different philosophies and you're kind of seeing what the end result at the end of the day is. And those are, I, I think, all all too often the most practical ones of which. So let's let's kind of dive into this paper, right? Yeah. Um, the, the links to the paper are going to be in the show notes so the people that are listening can go and kind of read it for themselves. But before we get into the methods specifically, what what kind what really motivated you to do this research in the way that you did it and what problems were or what questions were you trying to to answer initially yeah basically what you did what you said sorry <laughs> what you say so i i was just uh, looking forward to uh different uh, type of studies in training intensity distribution but basically i started from um, a coaching uh, question. So which kind of uh, training intensity distribution is the best, but it's not um, um, a question, uh, just this question is, is which kind of training intensity distribution is the best in uh, each period of the periodization of right. an athlete? Right. Because uh, you know, uh, you have read for sure many papers, and usually they compare okay, pyramidal with polarized or uh, block periodization with traditional periodization. It usually, never this never happens in the real uh, uh, field. In, exactly. In the, in, exactly. exactly. So, so th that's why I, I try to, to bridge this gap between um, uh, science and, and practice. And try to 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 um, uh, I say I can what I can say just solve this question that is um, which kind of training density distribution is could be the best in at, at the beginning or at the end of uh, a periodization. I know that this study that was published uh, is not enough. <laughs> we will try to to to, to, do, to do more because I, I know that you have. Uh, other question that came out from this, this, this yeah yeah from this study so Always. yeah um, but i think uh for the future of sports science we need to uh try to do more uh applied uh research because usually yeah you know it's important to do lab research uh try to understand the physiological mechanism but for coaches is to, to, to talk with coaches, it's so important to, to try to, uh, to answer some of them question. It, so let's kind of back up a little bit and let me paraphrase it. You're, yeah, yeah. What, you, what you're doing with this research design is you're looking at two different ways with which athletes can change their intensity distribution. And those two ways we we describe, and we're going to have to get into what this means practically because the audience is going to be largely yeah, unfamiliar yeah, sure. with, with these with this terminology. But these two ways are called pyramidal and, and uh, polarized. You're looking at those two different ways of distributing intensity 
and how potentially you could combine those ways throughout the course of a 16 week period to produce to to produce results. So before we get into the combined part of it, because I think that that's that's really practical, right? When we look at yeah. different people's philosophical training designs, you can see the way that you design this kind of mirrored actually out in the field within collegiate programs and track and field programs and things like that. But before we get into this, since we're talking about pyramidal versus polarized training, why don't you yeah. take a stab at describing those two intensity distribution models first, and then we can yeah. get into how, how you combine them in the 16 week period. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I have to start with training intensity distribution and the, that is uh, basically based on three zones. Um, the three zones are zone one, zone two, and zone three. Zone one is the intensity distribution corresponding to the um, uh, intensity below the first ventilatory threshold. The second zone, zone two, is the intensity zone between the first and second ventilatory threshold. And zone three is just uh, the intensity above the second ventilatory threshold. So we, we can start with this and say, and say that uh, the polarized train um, is defined as having the highest percentage of time spent in zone one, a smaller but relative high percentage in zone three, and only a small portion of training in zone two. Um, the pyramidal one uh, instead is accumulating a higher percentage of training time in zone two and less in zone three. Uh, but as in the case of uh, polarized model, uh, the highest percentage of training is spent in zone one. So uh, for a recap, uh, in uh, polarized training zone one, is, volume in zone one is greater than volume in zone three that is greater than uh, volume in higher than volume in zone two. And in polarized model, so, uh, the time in zone one is higher than the time in zone two that is higher than the time in zone three. So just a rough um, uh, example, a, a typical polarized model is for example, 80% of the time in zone one, 5% uh, of the time in, in uh, um, in uh, zone two and 15% in zone three. And pyramidal training intensity distribution is 80% in zone one, 15% uh, in zone two and 5% of time in zone three. So this is kind of uh, an example of what polarized and uh, pyramidal training intensity distribution means. And before we go any farther, for the listeners out there that aren't familiar with a three zone intensity model, because there's lots of models out there, and you and I both recognize this, and sometimes it just kind of makes me scratch my head. There's a three zone model as most basic, there's a five zone model, which will divide it a little bit differently. There's seven, and there's seven A, B, C, D, and then there's all these colloquial names for it. The, the way that you're defining zone one, zone two, and zone three, that is progressive throughout the intensity throughout the intensity spectrum. So zone one is easy, zone two is quote unquote medium, and zone three is hard. Yeah. And I, I think the way that, well, actually we can go through the actual workouts, I think to, to kind of bring this to light. So a zone one workout for the subjects in this, in, in, in this research would look like what? Uh, it looked like uh, 67 minutes at uh, uh, around uh, uh, 4.30 per kilometer. Uh, easy for these athletes because they're Easy for athletes. that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 easy. Between, between 4.30 and 5 minutes per kilometer. Okay. Zone yeah. 2 workout would look like what? Look like um, intervals like uh, continuous running, like 50 minutes at uh 340 345 per kilometer or intervals long intervals like uh four time uh, se uh seven minutes at around that pace so 340 345 per, per kilometer so, so inter interval work around i'm going to relate it to a race pace right 
interval yeah. work around 10k to half marathon pace would be r- roughly what what would encompass that intensity yeah range. exactly and then zone three would look like what yeah zone three look like uh basically intervals <laughs> faster intervals like uh 12 time two minutes at uh three at, at around um uh, an intensity between 5k and 10k um speed so for for that lot it was like 320 315 per kilometer so that one was an example and another one could be an, a, a faster again workout like three times 12 times 40 seconds on 20 seconds off at around that same similar pace so 315 320 for the tablets yeah most most people would describe that as a quote-unquote vo2 max interval right yeah, even though exactly. it might not elicit actually vo2 max but it's close enough to be to call it that i guess we, we can leave that description aside yeah. <laughs> but they're hard i guess is what i'm saying in this whole intensity spectrum yeah. so if we back up again if we back up again and we look at uh pyramidal uh intensity distribution there's a lot of zone one work easy there's a medium amount of zone two work and a medium amount of zone three work but more zone two work than zone three work if you go to the polarized model, there's a lot of zone one work, very little zone two work, and more zone three work. So th- thus the name polarized, right? You've got you've got the most intensity at the farthest ends of the spectrum, very easy and very hard. Yeah, exactly. Okay, now we're gonna get to the meat of it, right? The, and this is this is the brilliance in this whole this whole study design. I hope people can realize like doing a 16 week training intervention with a lot of very good athletes is not the easiest thing in the world to do because they all want, they all want to do their own thing right they don't want to do whatever the research design is. Uh, yeah it's it was too difficult to do that study <laughs> I, I was lucky that the subjects were uh, my athletes basically so the, the, that's why i was more uh uh uh, able to convince them that that the, <laughs> that the study was an opportunity and not a waste of time. So <laughs> you get your own guinea pigs all at the same time. I see, I see the design of the inner workings of your business right now. That's perfect. Okay, so there were basically four cohorts, right? Four ways yeah. that you designed that you designed the training over this sixteen week intervention. Why don't you take the listeners through what those what those four four, four cohorts the four cohorts we're doing during the 16 weeks yeah um i I can just start saying that these four cohorts were um divided by uh which kind of training intensity distribution they uh, did in the first eight weeks and in the uh, last eight weeks of of the training program um the two uh first cohort were um polarized and pyramidal that did for the whole 16 weeks uh both uh in one case so polarized group did 16 weeks of polarized training the pyramidal group did 16 weeks of uh pyramidal training and the other two group uh mixed uh, polarized and uh pyramidal in two different ways um, the pyramidal to polarize uh, did um, the first eight weeks pyramidal and the last eight weeks uh, of polarized. And the polarized to pyramidal did the first eight weeks of p- polarized and the other eight weeks of pyramidal. So basically, we had these four groups that were divided by the, um, the training intensity distribution that they did during the uh, first eight weeks and the last eight weeks. Uh, participants were uh, randomized uh, in the different groups. We had uh, 60 uh, participants that were able to complete <laughs> the study and uh, 15 in each group and were randomized uh, based on their um, fitness level that we tested at the beginning of the training intervention just to match the different group uh, for age, uh, 
relative uh, maximal uh, oxygen uptake, running performance in the uh, 5K time trial, but maybe we can talk about the test later on with, <laughs> in the yeah. discussion. No, you can. I, I think that that's important now. I mean, what's the what what's the like? How are you measuring the end results, right? How are you measuring? Okay, these people improve versus these people don't improve, and we'll come back to how and why that's important, kind of at the at the end of everything. Yeah, we basically tested them for um, uh, VO2 peak in particular, um, uh, velocity, speed at, this, uh, at uh, the two millimol block, blood lactate threshold and velocity speed at the four millimoles um, blood lactate threshold. Uh, we did a 5K time trial where we measure, of course, the time of the time trial and also lactate peak RPE and heart rate peak. So basically we had both physiological measure like VO2 and uh, heart rate, something like that, and blood lactate, but we had also uh, performance measure like speed at the two different threshold and also speed during the time trial or just time yeah. to complete the time trial. Okay, so 16 week intervention. Yeah one group does the exact same thing the entire time and we'll call that the pyramidal group and it's more we'll call it a quote unquote thresholdy right that's kind of threshold more threshold centric types of workouts yeah next group does the same thing the entire time and it's traditional polarized lots of easy stuff a little bit of really hard stuff does does yeah. that through the entire intervention the next two groups kind of mix and match those two one goes from the thresholdy stuff to the really intense stuff and the next group goes from the really intense stuff to the thresholdy stuff. And then they're all measured at the end of the day, 60 people total, right? I'm emphasizing yeah. that because I want to give you more credit <laughs> for, for getting this pool of athletes because it's rare. I mean, most of the time we're working on like N of eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was, it was really difficult because also we wanted uh, pretty well-trained yeah, athletes. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Just to give a, give a number to the to the uh, audience, uh, they are uh, around uh, 15, 16, or 16, 30 in the 5K. So not yeah high uh, professional athletes, but you know uh, it's night and not. Um, not they're so good. easy to have 15. Yeah, good. Yeah, they're good. They're good athletes. And yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people can go and they can I kind of identify with those PRs. They're, whether they're an 18 minute 5K runner or a 14 minute 5K runner, they kind of know, you know, where it is, even in even in the ultra running spe spectrum. They're 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 good yeah. enough runners. And the reason that that's important is you're not taking people from scratch, right? Because a lot of times <laughs> when you take people from scratch and you do a training intervention, they're gonna improve regardless. And it's hard to like filter through the, no the noise. Here you have experienced athletes that are already pretty good where the training design actually yeah. should actually should make a difference between between those uh be between all of those groups yeah and because i i think i think it's important sometimes to have this kind of athletes because when you read some papers you read or oh, oh god uh you have 10 10 percent of improvement it's kind of impossible yeah. in this yeah. <laughs> type of athletes so you 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 read okay with this intervention you got uh, Ten percent of improvement, but when you train real athletes, you know that also even zero point five percent of improvement is really high. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's that's why I think it's more important in in, in the future to have also really uh, to have studies with real high level athletes. Well, in 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 a lot of ways, the the design of the training architecture of the 16 week intervention actually plays out because if they weren't so good, they would all just improve regardless. But here they're already starting at such a high level. The training architecture actually makes a, makes a really big difference. Um, the, the one, the kind of the one design that really sticks out to me is the pyramidal to polarized. And this is every, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but this is every collegiate program in the United States uses this type of, <laughs> uses the type of structure. No, you're probably laughing because you've seen it. They do, 
they start out with a base building phase, which would be before yeah. the 16 week intervention. And then they do a thresholdy phase of what they would call tempo runs, 40 minute tempo runs, 60 minute tempo runs, maybe some longer efforts, two mile repeats and things like that. And then they transition on the track and they do thousands and four hundreds and stuff like that, roughly over these kind of eight week chunks that you that yeah. you mentioned. And so the here we've got this proof of concept, right? It's like here's like pretty much every collegiate program in the world has this one intervention. How do these other interventions kind of stack up with it? So <laughs> you mentioned that you're measuring at the end of the day, at the end of this 16 week intervention, you're looking at VO2 peak, fundamentally VO2 peak pace at the, di the different lactate thresholds, a two millimolar yeah. threshold and a, and a four millimolar molar threshold, and then 5K time trial, which is kind of the ultimate, you know, performance metric there. So what were the results at the end of the day, at the end of the 16 week intervention? Um, basically we had um, a, an improvement uh, in all these four groups. So we had the, an improvement in performance, and also in uh, relative VO2 peak and especially an improvement in the two uh, speed at uh, associated with the uh, uh, two lactate threshold. Um, the, the improvement was, uh, was not so big, just uh, around 0.51% of improvement in all the groups. But we, we noticed that the group that improved the most was the pyramidal to polarize. Exactly what you said about the uh, college athletes. They've all got it right. The, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But we, we started exactly with this, the same uh, hypothesis. We, we thought that starting from polar, pyramidal to polarize well, could, could have been the best to, to improve performance. We, we started with that hypothesis. And so we, we were pleased that the, the results were exactly on the same way. So, okay, I'm gonna back up then a little bit. Why, and this is that we're gonna to start to transition to the coaching part of this, right? Why was that the hypothesis? That the pyramidal to polarized group was going to improve the most. And for the record, I would have had that same hypothesis. When I actually, when I was reading the abstract, I'm like, oh yeah, that group's gonna improve the most given what you were measuring. So why, yeah. why was that specifically a hypothesis? Yeah, because uh, you know, as a coach, that the real uh, guide for the shape of an athlete is intensity. So modulating intensity from the start of the training program to the end, just picking the intensity, just guide the, the shape from the from a low shape to, to the top top uh, shape at the end of uh, a training intervention or a training program. So basically, I think that is not volume that guides the training, um, uh, the training program, the training, um, the shape increase through a training program. But I, I believe that um, that it's intensity, and that's why, um, yeah, many athletes train exactly in, in this way. So just uh, trying to reach a good volume uh, during the first phase of the season and like uh, in the base period and then they try to keep this volume or even reducing a little bit and trying to uh, keep up the, the the intensity through the periodization to keep the right form at, at the right moment because um, a, a typical uh, I think of mistake that uh, sometimes uh, coaches do is uh, to have a really high intensity uh, at the beginning, since the beginning of the periodization. And that uh, I think is kind of difficult uh, after that to guide the shape through a periodization in the right way and know when you have to pick exactly for the, for the, for the, for the competition. So I think it's, uh, the, the best way for train uh, endurance athletes is to keep high the volume at the beginning with low intensity and then increase gradually the intensity to modulate the shape of the athletes through the periodization. Um, uh, basically, um, the, 
this transition is because when you um, when you train harder, you get more uh, cardiovascular responses and cardiovascular stress. And this cardiovascular stress is an important uh, marker for uh, increased shape through periodization. So if you keep the cardiovascular stress low, your athletes did, uh, don't get fit. Uh, if, you, if you increase the, the cardiovascular stress, for example, doing interval session, uh, high intensity training, uh, VO2 max intervals, you increase the, your shape almost immediately after a few days. You know, as a coach right. and probably the audience know, if, if, you, if you are doing just base training and then you um, uh, start uh, doing a couple of intervals, after that, you realize immediately that you are in a higher shape than... <laughs> it doesn't take much, is what you're yeah, saying. No, it, it, doesn't, exactly. it doesn't take much. But exactly. let, let me, let me kind of, let's put a little bit of a different hat on, right? Because um, I know you work with cyclists and triathletes and runners and across yeah. a lot of different disciplines. Yeah. Would, you, would your hypothesis or do you think the results would be the same specifically on the performance metric part of it? You're using 5K to benchmark the performance if that performance benchmark were, let's say, in a different intensity domain, so let's say a marathon or even an Ironman triathlon, which would even be longer than that, longer than that could you, do you think that it's still a reasonable conclusion or would you start to change how you're thinking about it? No, I think the, the, the conclusion would have been completely different, completely different, but the, the, the only thing that doesn't, change to me it's that the increase in the intensity should remain so maybe hmm. for a, for a for a marathon or for a ultra marathon you have to start with more uh, pyramidal so i think even more volume uh, in zone one less in zone two and maybe nothing in zone three and then start uh, progressing the the intensity the, the increase in the intensity but maybe arrive at the end uh, of the training program with a full pyramidal training intensity distribution classical pyramidal i think could be an option because uh, you know that uh, if, if you are running a, a 5k a 5k time trial you are you are doing a zone 3 it's it, it's in zone 3 so that's why it's kind of specific training if you if you uh, go from yeah. pyramidal to polarized. Right. But if you are doing a marathon, the intensity target is zone two, because zone two is the specific marathon pace. Uh, so that, that's why I think it's even more important for um, for of course five k time trial going from pyramidal to polarized, but. I think maybe for marathon runners, you can arrive at, uh, at the end of the periodization with a pure, full pyramidal or a, um, kind of uh, equal volume in zone two and zone three at the end, just to pick. I think it's uh, one conclusion that can, can be translated to, to different disciplines, I think. What do, you, what, what do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, from a, so when I read the design, I look at what, what are the performance benchmarks? And then what is the physiology that's elicited from the training that is leading into those performance bench, benchmarks the most? And for this, the pyramidal to polarized group fits that narrative the best. You're teaching to the test with that yeah. group, essentially. Um, exactly. And from a from a training perspective, you know, it, I, this is one of the advantages, I think, with coaches like yourself, and, and, and I'll put myself in this category, uh, in my er, in the early part of my coaching career, of working with a lot of different athletes across different intensity domains. And you learn that the training that you're doing does, in fact, elicit subtle nuances across an athlete's physiology that may or may not be specific to the intensity domain of the event. 
So first you have to understand the intensity domain of the event. And you, you very eloquently just said 5k, it's VO2 max intensity domain, right? Marathon, yeah. it's zone two intensity domain. Exactly. Ultra marathon, it's zone one, or maybe even whatever's below zone one for some of these <laughs> ultra marathon, it's even, it's even easier than that. And if you kind of recognize that first, then you can design the training architecture to suit that. Now we can have a different debate on whether it goes from this to that or that to this, I would, I typically just take a least specific to most specific approach. I don't even call it polar, polarized yeah. and pyramidal or anything like that. If it's the most specific intensity of the race, you're doing the most of that close to the race. If yeah. it's least specific to the race, you're doing the most of that was far away from the race as possible. And then we kind of manipulate the intensity in, in between from an ultra marathon perspective with that if for most reasonable ultra marathoners yeah but that it's, either results in is just a lot of zone one work almost exclusively zone one work leading to the race or if they're really good maybe something that would resemble a pyramidal structure as you you know kind yeah. of alluded to yeah i i was thinking about about exactly what you say <laughs> with my bad english i was trying to explain what exactly you did you say so yeah perfectly agree with 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 your with your toe so what do we need to do next i mean you know you've kind of cherry picked a 5k right and you you started out you started out saying that you know we need to do we need to do more research to start to tease this out. Yeah, I feel like we keep circling the wagons around this and don't have a good conclusion because ten years ago, high intensity training was kind of all the rage, and you definitely saw a disproportionate amount of that in the like the, what I would call the field of practice across all of the different sports. And now it's kind of flip flop to, towards the other side where it's a lot of like low intensity that sort of rules the day when you look out there in the social media space and, 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 and a lot of practice. And I think the research drives that, right? If there's a yeah. lot of high intensity research that says, oh, this is better then people will go there. If there's a lot of low intensity research that says, you know, this is better than people will go there. So what needs to happen going forward to start to figure out the answer to this in your opinion yeah i think we need to start doing some more research like uh apply research because when, yeah. when you when you uh what you mentioned so the the rise in high intensity high uh high intensity interval training uh prescription uh around 10 years ago started from from some studies that compare just high intensity interval training with continuous running. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, you know <laughs> that you, if you do high intensity interval training versus yeah. continuous, the people that do high intensity interval training, of course, get better than the other. But right. never happens in real life that one athlete do only high intensity interval training and the other just continuous running. So that's basically a misunderstanding between science pure science and, and practice and so i think we need more mixed approach with high intensity and continuous running uh, low intensity session high intensity session just what as happens in the real life I well think and it's the same thing with the low intensity stuff now right we're yeah, going off exactly. on a tangent which the i think the listeners will kind of appreciate a lot of not all of but a lot of the move to more lower intensity work now across all of the endurance spectrum, marathon running, 10K running, cycling, triathlon, things like that, is driven by this, I'll say, case study and research narrative. There's kind of yeah. both of those at play. That not exclusively, but predominantly pits, uh, pits, a, pits an unfair situation. Athlete A does 10 hours a week of whatever intensity distribution, and then they increase their total workload to 12 hours a week, all in the low intensity domain. So it's automatically an unfair comparison, I guess is what I'm saying. You have an yeah, athlete yeah. that's doing 10 hours a week, an athlete that's doing 20% more, and all that extra 20% is all in the low intensity. Well, it kind of doesn't matter. Like if they're doing an extra 20% more, you could do whatever you wanted to do. They're still going to improve because there's just more workload. And the second, yeah, exactly. and the second kind of situation. So it's the exact, it's the mirror image of just what you mentioned on the high intensity piece that's happening now. And I completely agree with you that more of this 
how do we ebb and flow the intensities throughout a long period of time, not just four weeks, 16 weeks, 20 weeks, and things like that. I know that's hard research to design. You know that more than I do. <laughs> how does that actually impact A, physiology, and then B, outcomes? More of that needs to kind of come to the forefront to really kind of tease this answer. I think, you can tell me what you think. I think it's still going to be this, whatever you're doing last is the stuff that shows up the most. Like whatever physiology you're eliciting the most towards the end of the test or intervention, that's what's going to show up the most. And then, yeah, everything else kind of plays in the background, but that's the dominating force that happens. Yeah, I agree. Fully agree with you. Exactly what what, what I think. And we are. I can spoil or something. I, I, we are trying to do a 52 weeks intervention this year. <laughs> just to to try to 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 bridge again the gap but in cycling this year i cannot spoil it more but we are trying to, to to do a 52 weeks intervention in uh almost 60 cyclists and we, we are trying to do an intervention that can maybe can answer an other question not I cannot spoil her more now, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, that's a weak tease, man. Come on, <laughs> when we get offline, you can tell me the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 it will be tough, but we have, we have just started, and we, we try to 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 complete this one by the end of 2022, and then try okay. to publish uh, this paper. On. Well, we'll bring you back on when that comes out. So let, let's get this more back down to practical stuff, right? And I want to first start with your practice within the athlete that, that you're working with, um, which might be slightly different than this audience, which is predominantly ultra marathon runners. But it, we'll make that translation as a second step. But what are you doing either differently or do you have a higher focus on? Now that you've done this research and you've kind of studied the landscape a little bit more specifically with your athletes, like what, what specifics are you kind of like taking away from this and saying, you know what, I'm going to do more of this and less of that. I, I think, uh, this study, uh, basically just confirmed what I was doing with my athletes, uh, before. Um, so, uh, I, I think I just probably, um, understood understand that um uh the specific intensity of the race is just really really important at the end of the periodization so just doing um, a couple of weeks of really specific uh, race specific intensity at the at the, at the end of the periodization is really uh, important to yeah to make the athletes ready for the competition and um, get the athletes uh, in the right shape for the competition. That's maybe the most uh, important uh, take home message that I have for myself. And I think for, for the audience, yeah, you, as we said before, you need to, to modulate carefully the intensity through the periodization because the, the intensity is the marker of the shape during the periodization. So if you do too much intensity at the beginning, then it's kind of difficult to, to arrive in a good shape at the end, or just um, you have like a, a, a speed, uh, I don't know how to say in English, the speed of the, the motorcycle, uh, in, in your in your hand and, uh, <laughs> the and throttle uh, the throttle <laughs> okay yeah yeah and that one and when you when you when you um um get your intensity higher you have the you can go full gas and your athletes go up with the with the shape when so you have the power with the intensity the the ability to uh, really uh, modulate the shape of your athletes when you want. So I, I think it's important just not to go full gas from the beginning. Otherwise, you have uh, the the you, you have not not uh, enough uh, intensity at the at the end uh, to arrive at the good shape 
in uh, in that race. Yeah, you have to modulate it. I think that's the yeah. word that that I was keeping I was picking up on. You can't and as as this design actually shows even in a 16 week intervention, if you're at the same intensity the entire time, yeah, you might not improve. But even if you modulate the intensity, and I would be willing to guess, you can tell me if you have a difference of opinion on this, even if you almost took a randomized approach, where two weeks you did this type of intensity distribution and two weeks you did that type of intensity distribution, just kind of like flipped a coin, you know, at the at yeah. the track, you know, every week <laughs> to see what you to see what you were doing, that would probably elicit a better result than just doing the same intensity distribution over long periods of time because you're constantly stressing kind of different systems at that point. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And another thing that we can discuss and we can. Uh, also investigate in the future and I think it's really really cool uh, uh, topic I think uh, we need to understand um, how much recovery do you need mm. after a training block to get the the, 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 the the adaptation we did three weeks on one weeks off uh, so one week three weeks uh, high volume uh, and one week of taper three weeks of high volume and one week of taper for the 16 weeks and so it's uh, interesting to understand if you when you need to to taper in your periodization after two weeks after three weeks after four weeks or another question interesting question for the audience could be how many sessions per week do you need a taper after three weeks yeah. or after four weeks because if you train two times probably you need you don't need taper after three weeks if you need four times you need taper who knows and that's another question that probably uh, it's interesting to 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 look at during the next the next few few months dude i've always thought this three to one design i'm not knocking you because i know you've got to like standardize it in the research <laughs> i've always thought this three to one design so three weeks hard one week easy is just lazy like, yeah 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 there's a yeah. Li there's maybe a little bit of physiological basis for it across uh, across mainly the what we'll, we'll call the easy intensity domain but once yeah, you start have, to do a lot of workouts outside of that, and then you incorporate strength training workouts and things like that, it's just, uh, you can't find a physiological basis for it. It's almost, it's almost random. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can, I can say something more about the spoiler that, that I said before we are doing a, this kind of, a study comparing, um, what happens, um, if you, uh, taper during a week or if you distribute the same amount of load oh. during the harder the, 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 block style training yeah, yeah block style training is what you're describing yeah, you, exactly. you 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 distribute the training load in an uneven manner and so the way so let's just take an aerobic phase and you could tell me this is close or not and you're doing uh i'll make the math easy on me you're training five days per week and it totals 10 hours, right? So two hours yeah. a day. So in your evenly distributed model, you're doing exactly two hours a day, five days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or sorry, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, take Friday off, Saturday, Sunday, all two hours. In the blocked group, you would do like four hours on Monday, three hours on Tuesday, one hour on Wednesday, one hour on Saturday, one hour on Sunday. So it still adds up to 10 hours over the course of that entire seven yeah. day period. You're just, yeah. you're just lopsiding the, the well, the volume in this case, but you could do the same thing with overall workload to be concentrated across a few days. Is that generally what you guys are getting at? Yeah, exactly. Oh, I exactly. love it. I love it. This is the stuff that I want to come out because we've theorized on block style training versus evenly distri distributed training for a long, long time. There's a lot of good uh, research that's done out of Norway on cross country skiers where they've used block style interval training where one week they'll have four interval workouts and the next yeah. week they'll have two and the next week they'll have one and then they'll have a recovery phase. And that that is an interesting question to answer to where there's been a lot of really good preliminary research on. But like you said, stuff that, that needs to happen kind of more long term, I'd be super fascinated with. So you got to promise me you're going to give me like the sneak preview of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, teasing sure. it so hard on this podcast. We'll bring you. you back on and you can like release the release the results. Um, this has been great, man. Um, this is the first time meeting you. Uh, this is really fun. Uh, I, I appreciate your outlook on things. Um, 
where can the listeners learn more about you and your research either on social or over the web? Yeah, on all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or ResearchGate. Uh, so wherever they, they want, but uh, I think I'm more uh, active on Instagram. If they, if they have Instagram profile, I'm more active there. Uh, and also on Twitter, I publish all my articles. So if they want to, to, to check my profile, feel free to check it and follow me. <laughs> and the, the links to the handles will be in the show notes. But for those listening, what are the Twitter and Instagram handles? Yeah, uh, it's Luca Filipas uh, on both. <laughs> Perfect. Easy. <laughs> just, just easy. Just name and surname. It's uh, really uh, not so common. So I have another, no other. <laughs> <laughs> no underscore people. at backslash yeah, exactly. one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. All right. Well, really thanks, easy. man. Thanks for coming on, man. We're going to bring you back once the rest of this research comes out. Good luck to you with it. And um, you're contributing a lot, man. I think that you've got a bright, bright future ahead of you. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the invitation, and thanks for the, for the, uh, for the, yeah, yeah, for the compliments. Yeah, yeah, as you say, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Luca for coming on the podcast today. And as I mentioned from the intro. I think that this is one of the most important questions we have to answer in the sports science and the research world because it is extremely practical. What should I do tomorrow? What should I do over the course of the next month in terms of my volume and training intensity distribution? And how is that going to ultimately affect me as an athlete? So go and give Luca's work some support. Go follow him on, him on Instagram. I guarantee you, you will hear more and more from this individual as the years come along. Thank you to all the listeners out there. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends, share it with your training partners. If you have a coach, go ahead and share it with your coach. I think that these are really important questions that coaches and athletes need to have with each other. You can also give this podcast a rating or review on, on Apple Podcasts. I'm always very appreciative of those. It helps this podcast get out to a much wider audience. That's it for today, folks. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.